Good evening, everybody. Welcome all to another webinar series hosted by Red Sari. Red Sari, it hosts a platform to promote a healthier and happier lifestyle for South Asians. And our vision is to promote the overall health and well being of South Asians through outreach and education efforts designed to implement a comprehensive strategy of healthy diet, moderate exercise good sleeping habits, and excellent mental health. This is our mission for Red Sari. Having said that, it's our pleasure to invite Dr. Kanix Kanikeshwaran, who is actually going to be talking extensively on the effect of music and how it helps us to have a relieved and a stress-free lifestyle, especially in today's time when COVID is the new normal and uh, it's going to be extremely informative. And this is what Red Sari promotes, you know, through uh, means of art forms and lifestyles that we can promote a healthier lifestyle among South Asians. I have a few, um, uh, how, yeah, some housekeeping notes here. Please keep all your lines muted and you can all submit your questions at the end by using the chat box and we will address all the questions at the end of the presentation. And today's webinar will run approximately for 60 minutes. And this webinar is being recorded. And the recording for today's discussion will be made available on Red Sari, Facebook, and YouTube channel. Breaks are not scheduled. If you need a break, please feel free to excuse yourself. But please keep all your lines muted. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Kanix Kanikeshwaran. He is known fondly to us Cincinnatians and to all his friends as Kanix. And he's also known as the magic musician from Madras. He's trained in classical and Hindustani music and his knowledge and passion for music has instrumented him in leading community choirs in the US and in Europe. Two of his best choir productions are Shanti, A Journey of Peace that has performed all over the US, and Murasu, an all-exclusive Tamil symphony that was performed at the 10th World Tamil Congress at Chicago last year. He has numerous notable choir productions, choral performances, lectures, workshops, and articles to his name. I welcome Dr. Kanix. It's our pleasure. And it's always a pleasure as a friend for me to listen to him talk. He's so well-read. He's so knowledgeable on music. It's an absolute pleasure just to listen to him. So I would want all of you all to enjoy this presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Subhadra, for the kind words. Um, can you see me? Is my camera on and everything? Yeah. Yes, we can okay, see Everything you. is good. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to leave this, um, I'm going to keep this kind of uh, unstructured. And the, first of all, I want to thank uh, Red Sari for the, uh, for the opportunity to share my work with all of you. It's a joy to be here, especially when we're all shut down like this. And it's, it's really nice to be able to share ideas in a topic that I care a lot about. It's nice to know that a lot of people are interested in it, and uh, hopefully we will uh, um, en engage in some stimulating discussions towards the end of the talk today. So um, I've been aware of Red Sari's efforts over the last, uh, what has it been a year now, or a little more than a year? Yeah. So in, yeah, I can't hear you. Um, it is a year, it's a year, okay. and uh, we would have had our second gala in April if not for COVID. So, okay. Yeah. okay, yeah, maybe hopefully in the third gala we will, uh, um, we will all be able to meet live and- Absolutely, actually Absolutely. Able to, Yeah. See, um, music and mindfulness, that's the that's topic that is chosen for today. So uh, what role does music play in mindfulness? And first of all, what is mindfulness and everything? So that's going to be the topic of the conversation today. So in most things that we, most of the performances that we do, whether it's Shanti or whether it is Murasu or whether it's Chitram or whether it's any old 
choir rehearsal or any um, talk on the subject of Muthuswami Dikshitar or or Tamil literature or Tamil music or anything like that. One of the fundamental things that we go towards exploring and understanding is the fundamental idea of interconnectedness of all of life and re really more a search for a true selves or more fundamentally it's in the uh, it's in the uh, i think you're getting a message uh, subhadra uh, please put put him in the speaker mode so i don't know how you would do that yeah so more fund fundamentally trying to answer the very fundamental question of uh, who am I? Naan yaar, that's a Tamil question. So it doesn't, have, it doesn't even have to be a philosophical inquiry. It just can be a very commonsensical inquiry. And this kind of an inquiry becomes more and more and more relevant when you pursue music at a very deep level on, on one side and also on the other side. During a situation like this, when the entire world is being controlled by a formless virus, um, no, no, no. Um, when it's being controlled by something like that, it, this kind of a question as to who we are and who who we can be becomes much more and more relevant in uh, the pandemic situation of today. So I'm going to um, switch to my presentation and share my screen and uh, just share, share a few slides with you and then explore these topics, and then we'll have a discussion towards the end. So um, here's the screen. Okay, you can see the screen, right? Yes. Yeah, okay, good. So, oh. right now, um, we are inundated with information. So, COVID is pretty much the talk of every phone con conversation, whether I co when I call my mother in the mornings back in India, she talks about how many cases have uh, been detected in Tinagar in Chennai. And here the question is, is, is are Ohio, Ohio's numbers improving? Okay, masks here and there. On, on top of that, this, uh, we are going through a historic period of uh, um, a con serious conversations regarding race relationships. We are actually living through history at this point in time. Plus things like uh, PPE, insurance, availability of testing, social distancing, vac vaccines, and so on and so forth. No, no matter like Barbie used to say, wherever you look at, it's a conversation of freedom. So now wherever you look at, it's a conversation of uh, COVID. So the impact it has on us is this. So we're just ready to go crazy. Okay. So what can help us at this point, point in time? This is the serenity that we are all yearning for in a disturbed situation like this. So this brings us to the con the topic of mindfulness and what is mindfulness so i'm going to read this out the purpose the process of purposefully bringing one's attention to experiences occurring in the present moment without judgment it is a process that one develops through meditation and through other training let me read this again purposely bringing one's attention to experiences occurring in the present moment, that is living in the present moment without judgment, no matter what happens. It is a process that one develops through meditation and through other training. So simply translated, if you reflect deeper on the statement, it's about just being in the present moment, moment just being present to what you need to be present to and not let, letting your opinions or your thoughts or your other things cloud what is happening to you in the present moment. And this can be briefly summarized in one phrase, which reads cessation of mind wandering, cessation of mind wandering. And if I translate this phrase into Sanskrit, what I get is chitta vritti nirodha. So, and this is, this happens to be the second sutra in a historic work 
called the Yoga Sutras, which were compiled by a Rishi called Patanjali, where he gave form to the um, philosophy of yoga, to the, to the practice of yoga, uh, with the second sutra saying, yoga is nothing other than Chitta Vritti Nirodha, which is pretty much the elimination of all this kind of wandering and being in a uh, purely, totally mindful state at any given point in time. So that is what yoga is. So, or, or in other words, you can look at yoga as one where you uh, just still yourself and then you're so still at this point that there's nothing to, dis to distract you from your consciousness and you realize what your true consciousness is. And uh, it's, it's a process of self-discovery, so to say. Um, and all this is centered around mindfulness, which is a need of the hour at this point in time. So there are many uh, works of literature that speak about yoga in a very powerful way. The first, uh, uh, the, the first thing that comes to people's minds is the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, which were written more than 1500 years ago. Equally important is the Tirumandiram of uh, the Tamil saint called Tirumula, who lived just around the same time. In fact, the Tamil saint Tirumula acknowledges Patanjali in his, in his work as one of his uh, uh, co-rishis engaged in spiritual pursuit. So Tirumandiram is a Mandiram is a colossal work of more than 3,000 hymns, and it's not known much outside of this out, outside of the Tamil speaking region. Now the Tirumul, the Tirumandiram is is a liturgical work. It's in the it's rooted in the Saiva religion, but then within it are chapters on yoga, which speak of uh, there's tremendous volumes of information packed in there about yoga, not just yoga. The Tirumul Tirumolar and Tirumandiram uh, teaches you to treat the body as something special. It's a vehicle that you're gifted with. It is your responsibility to nurture it. He even talks of uh, situations where of, of people not taking care of their bodies. Like uh, he gives his example of a fictitious person or a normal person who indulges in food and other luxuries of life. And at one point in time, feels a stinging pain. In, his, in the left side of his body and within minutes he's gone. So that, or in other words, 1500 years ago, uh, Tirumola describes a picture of a heart attack. Then he describes many different breathing techniques and so on, but uh, what we are more interested here today is uh, in his description of uh, the uh, Ashtanga Yoga. Now there is many different types of yoga taught commercially today. Uh, but one word that keeps uh, repeating in the yoga circuit is the Ashtanga Yoga. Ashtanga Yoga, if you break it, the, if you break the word Ashtanga into two words, it's Ashta and Anga, the eight limbs of yoga. So yoga is not just about physical poses. I will come to music in just a bit, but it's important to go through this conversation about yoga before we get into music because we're talking about mindfulness here. So um, the components of yoga um, are yama and niyama, which relate to physical disciplines of uh, uh, the kind of uh, things to do and not to do in order to bring yourself into a state of mindfulness. Asanas, so of the eight angas of yoga, it's the asanas alone that deal with the physical poses that we kind of reduce to poses like um, uh, the cat, the dog, um, uh, uh, and and uh, uh, the peacock and so on and so forth. So yoga really cannot be reduced to physical poses. It's much more than that. It's a combination of all of this. Then pranayama. Pranayama is the science of regulated breathing. And of late, um, the Western world has started taking note of pran pranayama. And they've even talked about uh, the merits of uh, um Pranayama using different medical, medical terms as such and what they've described is I'll just come up with a trace and just a bit. It's nothing other than pranayama. It's just regulate, regulated breathing. Uh, and there's many different ways in which you can do pranayama. Then pratyahara and uh, dharana and dhyana, those deal with meditation, focusing on a source. And what all this will lead you to is a state of samadhi where you're perfectly aware of who you are. Um, and of everything that's around you and what you can negate looking at and so on and so forth. So that's Ashtanga Yoga. So there's, there's, there's a sutra in Patanjali's Yoga Sutras that says what the eight uh, components are, which is basically these Yama, Niyama, Asana, Pranayama, Pratyahara, 
dharana dhyana samadhayo ashtang ashtavangani ashtavangani that's what patanjali says and whereas trimolar says iyama niyama okay and when you get into the study of yoga if you get into the bhagavad gita it talks about the three forms of yoga the yoga of uh, knowledge jnana yoga bhakti yoga the yoga yoga of devotion and the yoga of karma where you indulge in uh, work for the sake of uh, work itself and not uh, um placing expectations of your control o- over what the work is going to yield okay and then hatha yoga is nothing other than the physical forces that are involved in uh, asanas raja yoga is the science of meditation and tantra yoga is the yoga of of worshiping using a yantra a, a mantra and a tantra which also trimula deals with in detail i'm going to add to this list the concept of nada yoga nada yoga is uh, finding yourself discovering yourself through music music op- occupies an exalted place in indian spiritual thought um if you look at this work called the sangeeta ratnakara which is written about 1000 years ago it the sangeeta ratnakara is pretty much a bridge between northern indian music of today and southern indian music of today it was written by a musicologist called sarangadeva and uh, sarangadeva was one came about 1000 years after bharata bharata muni who wrote the natya shastra which has the grammar of uh, indian classical music as also the work called uh, silapadikaram which is written just around the same time as the natya shastra the only difference is that the silapadikaram is completely in tamil and it has uh, volumes of music on uh, volumes of information of what what the the musical system was like 2000 years before our time and isn't it just amazing to actually be able to read a work that uh, is written written in your mother tongue um it takes a lot of effort to understand it though it's not the same tamil as we speak today but then there's volumes of information on how harps were tuned what the different scales were and how you could tra- transition from one scale to another and what was the idea of dance and how many fo- what kinds of dances were there what kind of makeup was involved what kind, what kind of stage lighting and it's just mind boggling kind of details that were written 2000 years ago then the entire universe is nothing other than um, that which manifested itself out of sound itself and let's get into that in just a minute nada the word nada refers to sound and uh, there there is this uh, shloka in the sangeeta ratnakara which goes the chaitanyam sarvabhutanam vibhritam jagadatmana nada brahma tadana tadanandam advitiyam upasmehe what see to get into this uh, nada and uh, nada brahma one what what we are to be conscious of is that the uh, idea the model that the entire universe became manifest from the unmanifest energy from the cosmic energy it is a cosmic energy in the form of sound that we refer to as the nada brahma okay so nada brahma is the primordial sound to which we attribute all the manifest the entire limitless manifest universe of which you and i are a part i am a part of this entire entirety of creation in, and in a sense i am this creation itself you in this in a sense are this creation itself and uh, all this can be traced back to that pr- the, the primordial sound which is also given a form in the syllable om which is referred to as omkara which is supposed to be made of three sounds a o n m and uh, which is adequately referred to in the work in tamil by trimula and elsewhere in sanskrit and, and in other languages all over india so i'm keeping my focus on indian music for a for this point in time i will uh, widen it to include other forms of music as well and just a little bit but everything fundamentally goes back to that nada that source of sound itself so when we turn our tambura uh, tambura on and listen to the shruti and just uh, just go 
with it. All we are doing is identifying ourselves with that primordial sound of creation. And that's a, that's a very powerful meditation in itself. Just identifying ourselves with that sound and resonating with it. Um, and it is music and music when it's, when it's delivered with intentionality has been associated with miracles and there are examples in history. There's a musicologist by name Subbarama Dikshitar who lived about 100 years ago, who, di uh, who died, I think, in 1906 or something. So he lived more than 100 years ago. He was a nephew of Uttar Swami Dikshitar. And he, has, he wrote a work called the Sangeeta Sampradaya Pradarshini. And in, in this, and uh, for, for those who speak Tamil, um, Mahakavi Subramanya Bharatiyar has written a page about Subramanya, uh, Subrama Dikshitar's musical genius. Now, Subrama Dikshitar is credited with documenting a huge volume of music. Now, documentation is very important, and Indian, cult in, um, uh, Indian culture has not been great about documenting history in written terms. Most of it is documented in, most of it has been passed down through generations in a very oral format. Um, Sangeeta Sampradaya Pradarshini was a huge attempt to write things down. Uh, it was published in 1906, and in there, he talks about the power of music and musicians to make miracles happen. One example he gives is that of his uncle, Muttaswami Dikshita, um, who approximately in 1820 was traveling through a place called Ettayapuram, where um, the land was parched because it was a huge drought. And uh, he sang a ragam called Amrita Varshin, and his was, his was the first ever composition in that raga. And what is interesting here to me is that uh, uh, there is a Tirukkural which goes Vanin Rulagam Varangi Varadalal Tan Amridam Indrunara Part. So Tiruvalluvar compares the life giving rain to nothing other than Amrita, which, which is a life giving uh, uh, nectar. When we say Amritam, we actually imagine a pot full of a liquid which will make you live forever. But actually, Amritam just translates into that without death. That can be a cause of, uh, um, which is the opposite of death, basically. So, water has a rejuvenating property. So, this Raga is called Amrita Varshin. So, the Raga is capable of getting the Amritam, Amritam down from the skies in the form of rain. Um, Subrahma Dikshita talks also of another musician who lived another couple of hundred years ago who sang the Raga Vasanta and was able to create a cool breeze in the midst of uh, a hot summer. So, um, so these are some, of, then also we all know the story of Tansen and how he almost burned himself to death by singing the Deepak Raga and how he nullified that by having his daughters sing Mia Malhar at the same time. So miracles are associated with the um, with intentional music. So when you're mindful, when you're able to focus your energy on something that you want to happen, miracles happen. Of, after all, what else is a miracle? Right? Um, so now, how do, do you achieve mindfulness by singing? See, the act of singing itself is uh, referred to in ancient, music has been considered to be an exalted form of art in the Indian tradition. So it's referred to as a Gandharva Veda in um, some traditions. And it is also uh, considered to be a, a, uh, an art form that is capable of granting you relief or uh, uh, the termination of the cycle of the endless cycle of uh, birth and death. Okay, Moksha Margam Niyashtati, that is what uh, is said about music. Um, so let's just look at the idea of singing. When you sing, there's many things involved. It's not just blind singing. Of course, these days it's a lot easier to just pick up a TikTok or a karaoke application or something and just start singing along with it. But when you sing, if you just observe yourself and see what you're doing, you're doing quite a bit of things. One is you're focusing on the breath. So for me to sing just one note, I have to take in the right amount of air and leave it out for the right period of time. So I have to have very good breath control. So for good singing, you need very good breath control. Then you're focusing on the pitch. So uh, music has, um, in very simple terms, you're talking about pitch and rhythm as essential um, elements of music. By pitch, what we mean is the ability of the, by pitch sense, what we mean is the ability of the uh, uh, brain to register the frequency at which you're hearing something, like let's say the tambura, and then 
the brain sends a signal to your uh, vocal apparatus to say, hey, produce a voice that matches that pitch. Then if you are um, attuned to it, then you sing, then your pitch matches what's out there. And if you're not uh, pitch sensitive, then you let out a pitch that may or may not match what's, what you're hearing out there. And we'll, that's a part of a separate conversation. But the focus on pitch is what uh, an essential activity of singing. The third is focus on rhythm. So there is a beat associated with songs. And there's also beatless music, which we refer to as uh, alabane in Tamil or alap in Hindustani music and unmeted singing, so to say. So chants, which may not necessarily be in beat. Uh, in beat. So, uh, but if they are in beat, you have, there's, there's a focus on rhythm also. And then finally, for more experienced singers, or even other ways, this, this focus on expression. So if you, if you go to a village, or if you go to, see one of the most expressive forms of singing that I've heard is there was a vegetable vendor who used to sell vegetables in a house when I was like eight years old. And, uh, she sang one line uh, of how people used to make fun of her because her name was Mariamma and uh, she said, but she went by a different name. So my mother asked her, why didn't you refer to yourself as Mariamma? She said, muttu Mariamma. Um, she said all her relatives and friends used to make fun of her singing that line. So she gave up that name apparently. But that one line that she sang still lingers in my, in my head. It is as good as um, as Janaki's voice, or uh, or remember that huge sensation that happened just a year ago, where there was this lady singing in a railway platform, and she became uh, uh, teri meri, teri meri. a stunning voice like that, just out of nowhere. So all these things stay in your mind because of the expression that they inherently carry. So you may be technically sound, but if you don't carry an expression. You, the music probably does not have any meaning. So an expression usually comes from understanding what you're singing and also conveying something. So, um, so that leads us to instrumental music where you deal with no words. But in instrumental music, there's always a technique. And uh, the technique of playing the violin and um, uh, the uh, idea of perfection in tuning, the idea of per perfection in bowing, the idea of perfection in any um, sound delivery and also, you know, there's a fundamental difference in instrumental music between the Indian and the Western tradition. In the Indian tra tradition, instrumental music is pretty much designed to mimic or reproduce the human voice. Whereas in Western traditions, there's music that's specifically written for instruments. And many, when many instruments play together, it's a combined effect that you're hearing of different frequencies, different ranges and different parts playing at the whole time. So it's a different, completely different uh, uh, aesthetic altogether. Uh, but then there's plenty of ground for these to meet. And one of the things that happened 200 years ago is the fact that the violin got absorbed into Indian music, but it literally got converted into an Indian instrument where Indian music is played uh, on the violin. The violin is tuned differently. It is totally handled differently and so on. So. Um, I, will, I want to bring, bring up this topic of the art of listening. Listening to music, it's a, it's a huge art. When you put on your headphones and walk around when you're going for a walk, particularly, particularly during the COVID epidemic when there's tons of music for you to listen to. Um, if you pay attention to the lyrics alone, the joy you get is something. If you pay attention to the, uh, uh, the tonal purity, it's something else. And if you pay attention, if you contextualize what you're listening, if you place yourself in the shoes of the composer that actually tried, tried to create a composition, for instance, if you're listening to Salil Chaudhary and uh, listening to O Sajana Barka Baharai that was composed, what, 50 years ago probably, and uh, just try to visualize what the situation was like and how the song would have been recorded and how the voices. Um, sang that without the aid of the gadgets that you have today, the, the joy that you get out of that is a lot more. And similarly, when you listen to some of the classical music recordings from the 1950s and the 60s, which are recorded without any the, the sophisticated technical uh, equipment that you have, again, the joy that you get out, out of that is something. Or if you watch a movie like Amadeus and uh, then go back and listen to some of the scores, some of the scores, and there's again plenty available on YouTube. 
uh, and look at the interplay of instruments and how one sounds against the other um, and how one interacts with the other. And then you learn a little bit of music appreciation and get into, get into it. The joy you get is a lot more. So informed listening is uh, definitely gives you a lot more joy than uninformed listening. But again, with, uh, with informed listening, you get to be a more discerning listener and you may stop enjoying some stuff which you might have enjoyed before. So there's pros and cons, cons to both ways of listening. Um, so the next thing I want to bring about is the singing in a group. Look at this picture. This is from one of our Shanti productions, which is, this was from 2014 when we performed at the Aronoff Center. Look at the number of people, oh, uh, number of people standing here. Is it, this is totally impossible today. We really cannot stand within such close proximity of each other. No, and we really have to stand wearing masks today. So this kind of singing, uh, it's very nostalgic. I don't know when we are going to get back into the days of singing like this again. So there's only one thing I want to bring up, bring about here. So when a group of a hundred people gets together and just sings one pitch in unison, it's like mm, the energy that is generated is just phenomenal. And when they sing in unison, when they, when they sing a song in perfect unison, the joy that is generated is even more, it, it is many fold. And when they sing in harmony with many different pitches, many different voices singing different pitches, but yet they all gel together at the same time the joy gets even more multifold. Um, and then when what we are singing actually happens to be lyrics based on ancient chants for peace, the point I maintain is that literally the air that we breathe changes. At the end of every rehearsal, we are different people. Our body goes through, um, what do you call the, um, there's a Tamil word called Pulagangit. And uh, it's basically the entire body um, goes through a series of vibrations so the the energy that you um, get uplifted to it is some, it's something totally different when you are part of an experience like this and I can speak from the standpoint of being having been on both sides um, when you sing and when you produce the music that's been written and uh, you generate it together for an hour or so you're totally totally present and from when I stand on the other side and when I conduct it again I am totally, totally present because I can't afford any slip ups at all. So f when I can see an hour's program floating away, it becomes timeless almost. Time completely just stops for you because at that point in time, all that matters is my fidelity to what needs to be sung at that point in time. The, my adherence to um, my commitment to keeping all the voices to get together at the same time, making sure that nobody is off cue or anything like that. Or in other words, we are living totally in the present moment during a choir concert. Or in other words, we are just being mindful. And uh, there's no better way to be in a state of mindfulness than singing in a choir. Um, so now here we are in the post. Uh, sorry, uh, this was, uh, I don't know why it auto-corrected into tandem, tandemic reality. But Anyway, it's supposed to be the post-pandemic reality. So we're going through a pandemic. And uh, ironically, I wrote, wrote an essay about a year ago saying that, hey, we are past the era of pandemics. Our children don't even know what a pandemic is. And at least we, uh, some of us raised in India in the 1960s, we are aware of diseases like smallpox and the vaccinations that were needed to prevent it and all that. Our children have thankfully got, gotten past that stage. But unfortunately, they are uh, fully immersed in, this, in the world of uh, corona and COVID and all that stuff. If you look at this picture here, all you see is violinists wearing masks and playing. Sadly, this is the reality of today. Because um, while on one hand, choir singing is one of the best things that, that has ever happened to human beings. Uh, if you can imagine the number of people singing in choir in the United States, it's at, it's at least 50 million people, five zero. It's quite a lot of people. Every sixth person at least sings in a choir. So all that activity has come to a standstill. So it's not. So there are all kinds of choirs in the um, in this country. So the church choirs on one side, the community choirs, which just express their identity and the message on one side, the professional choirs, which actually do ensemble music, where in ticketed performances, those are another. But all of them have stopped because. Uh, it's, it's been declared and it's been discussed and debated at the ACDA and a lot of other venues that uh, choir singing is actually 
not conducive to good health and it's conducive to actually to the conducive to the spread of the disease so it, it, they say that if you sing now it's as bad as sneezing or coughing in front of people so it's advised not to conduct rehearsals except if you're conducting rehearsals in the open air and if you're widely spaced out and all this stuff i don't know how long it's going to take for this situation to uh, clear itself out so orchestral music is at least possible possible but again just imagine the reality um, if you watch nutcracker there'll be at least 120 musicians on stage no more um, you cannot have that many people on stage anymore people are going to be separated out they're all going to be wearing masks so that's going to cut down the number of people that are going to be playing nutcracker if the pandemic continues but what about wind instruments if singing is bad, so equally bad is blowing into a flute or an oboe or a clarinet or, or the brass. Um, so because you cannot wear a mask and play a trumpet. So the solution that symphonies are coming up with is that they will probably have the brass section seated and the woodwind seated in the first balcony and then mic them there and have them fed through monitor, monitors on stage. Um, so that is the impact on the performers. But what about the audiences? Audiences for now are kind of probably staying away from mass get-togethers, but at some point in time, in time when we actually want to go see concerts, what's going to happen is there are rules of distancing, um, mandated distancing that would involve seating um, spaced out by two seats each and also leaving one row empty. So which means that a 2,000 capacity concert hall is going to be reduced just to a capacity of 500. So that's the reality. Will the Tyagaraja Aradhana in Tiruvayar happen next year? We don't know. Will a, a mass a filming like the movie Anian be able to happen? We don't know. Uh, festivals, folk dances, and uh, uh, St. Pat Patrick's Day parades and things like that. Um, we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know what the, what the future holds for us. So that is pretty much a post, uh, the, 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 the COVID period and the post-COVID reality. So what can we do during the stage? How can we get through it? So uh, um, it's not just for musicians, but it's just for everyone. For everyone, uh, for, for musicians, what we need to do is this is an opportunity for us to hone our arts and then uh, to, to get stronger on our skills. It's very easy to get depressed, but then there's ways out of it. Um, but this is a great opportunity to work on our skills, to get our, ourselves, educate, ourselves educated, trained in a lot of other um, areas related to music or even develops allied musical skills and so on and so forth. There's plenty we can do and that's a separate topic altogether. More than that, we can actually get through the, we can also attempt to help fellow musicians, especially the ones that are not tech savvy, helping them get online so that they can teach others. And again, that's a different conversation. I've written an article elsewhere. I'm happy to forward you that article. Um, but in general, as human beings, one of the things that we can do and we should do is this. We have no business other than staying optimistic throughout this crisis. Of course, I'm speaking of this fully cognizant of the fact that we are treating this as a, treating this, looking at it from a first world problem standpoint. There are people whose livelihoods are affected. But for, for those of us that are watching this presentation, we are looking at it from the standpoint of how can we contribute? So the first and foremost thing that we can do is to stay optimistic and do not get pessimistic at all. And how do we stay optimistic? One is um, uh, um, this, the way of being mindful will help you get there. But before that, it's important to, to emphasize the fact that we ourselves alone are responsible for our physical well-being and mental well-being. We alone are responsible for our physical well-being and our mental well-being. So as far as physical well-being goes, the, the, the COVID reality offers, definitely offers time to take care of ourselves, our physical selves. Um, the gyms are closed, but then there's other things that can be done at home and out the outside space. Fortunately, it's still summer and we're going to have summer for another couple of months. Um, and on the, on the mental side, um, this is a time to enhance our skills learn a new language, get uh, familiar with rules of grammar, um, even study, study music appreciation, read uh, other forms of music. Um, uh, try listening to other forms of music. There's a plethora of resources that are available on the web. Um, there's nothing stopping us from getting access to any of those or all of those. Definitely we have more disposable time in, the, in this era than what we had uh, in the pre-COVID era. 
no travel, right? So make use of the travel time to um, enhance our skills. So I get the bottom line is that there is no hurry to get anywhere at all. There's no hurry to get anywhere. So that um, automatically involves a kind of slowing down and almost a progress to the state of stillness. And once in that state of stillness, um, let's listen to more music and let's be present to music. Let's be mindful about listening to music. Let's care for each other. Let's offer gratitude and support to the folks that are on the front lines. And uh, let's offer support to the folks that are affected by the pandemic. And uh, technology gives us connectedness and the ability to act collectively also. But let's use technology to connect with our friends through group video sessions and maintain our sanity. And this is not the end of the world. We will live through it. We will see a better tomorrow. We'll create a better tomorrow. So, um, so at a personal level, let's just make a resolution that we will emerge stronger physically and spiritually as this era unwinds. Um, so that's all I had. I'm open to questions. Thank you so much, Kanix. The talk itself, you know, the flow itself was very meditative, according to me. Oh, because thank you. <laughs> you, start, you, know, you started off with, you know, talking about yoga, Patanjali and Tirumular, where yeah. you kind of sensitized and focused our minds and made us mindful. Okay. Having Thank set you. the stage, mm -hmm. then you started talking about, you know, the historical background of music a little bit, the history of music, and what music has to offer us, and instrumental music has got to offer us. And then finally, you, you know, culminated in how it can all be put to use. You know, okay. what our ancestors said and what music can do that could be put to use for us in these dire times. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Subhadra. And uh, so, Kanix, I, my, my first question to you is, I know I have been part of your choir, a uh, couple of your choir presentations, and I have mm -hmm. gone through the exercises. Mm -hmm. And I've seen always in your, uh, in your practice sessions, yeah. the first 10 minutes, mm -hmm. you will make us all get our minds focused and get mindful. Yes. And you would do multiple exercises, you know, like breathing exercises, humming exercises, yeah. chanting exercises. Mm -hmm. So could you talk a little more about that and tell how people in their, you know, let's say somebody is really worked up sitting in front of their computer or they are really getting worked up, you know, because they are late for their meeting, how they can quickly get themselves reset by using these kind of exercises to bring them back to a little more calmer mindset. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so typically what we do in choir is it all typically what choirs do in general is that they have have a lot of what are called warm up exercises. What, what we mean by that is that um, they uh, when you start singing your voice, your voice is not really warm. And it needs needs to uh, um, get to a certain state where you can sing fluently hit all the right pitches and uh, um, not break or crack or anything like that. So to do that, you do exercises like, like ha, 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 and all that kind of stuff. So I've kind of adapted them, but I added a few more things beyond that. One is uh, um, just focusing on a pitch and also breathing and getting there. So if you take a deep breath, for example, and there was this pitch that's playing on the tambura, which goes, mm, So the key thing is to hold enough air in your lungs and then let it out very carefully. Mm. For as long as you can. Okay. And then the then another exercise that we do is divide the group into two divide the choir into two groups. One sings a note below, so they will be holding on the note. The other group holds. And we also sing using the sound so that the vibrations kind of so the you feel a buzz in the lips mm. as you sing. Mm. So. Things like this really get you aligned. And then you move it to different combination of pitches. And then um, we usually sing a chant like um, the Tamil sessions that we had. We used to sing a chant which started with Uruvai, 
Uruvai Aruvai and all that, which is written by the poet uh, Arunagiri Nadar 400 years, 400 years ago. Yes. So it's important to center yourself. It's important to ground yourself because that, that is what puts you in the mood for the rest of the session. And uh, like you rightfully said, uh, Subhadra, if you're in the middle of a stressful situation, when you actually go and do this, it, um, um, it, it, it grants you a... a um, what, what, what can I say? It takes you to a dif different space. And after that, the problems that you're dealing with do not seem as uh, yes. uh, uh, huge as they, they were before. Like in, even in real life, I've run into situations like on, on a Friday, Friday evening, you get a um, disturbing email as to some, some disruption, in the concert activity for the weekend or something is not working out. Somebody has dropped out. I, and there was a real, real life example that happened to me in 2004. Somebody had dropped out, somebody key and critical. So all I did was, um, I didn't even talk about it. I knew that we couldn't deal with it until Monday. So I okay. just uh, lit, lit a lamp or a candle and just stayed with the pitch for like 15 minutes. And after that, I said, okay, now I, have, I don't need to think about it till Monday morning. And after all, um, the, the problems pretty much lie in between the two years, right? So, and Monday morning, the problem resolved itself by itself. So. Okay. Now, will this be comparable to, you know, I've heard um, music therapy done with the gong music of the Tibetans and, uh, you know, they do sessions like that to uh, focus and, uh, you know, mindfully bring yourself, your senses together, like a meditative chant. You know, will the, can that be comparable to that? You know, is that the same uh, reason why that is being implemented? Uh, no, those are different um, in the sense that the, the focus there is not music. The focus is actually getting your, your getting the the adherence into a state of meditation with the sound of the with the uh, sound of the gong and with the sound of the singing and the chanting itself. Okay. Like in Tibet, there's a chant that that goes Om Mani Padme Hum Om Mani Padme the repetitive nature of the whole thing takes you into an almost like a trance-like state. And I've also heard experienced Tibetan, Tibetan bell-based meditation and chanting and all that. Okay. Um, there the focus is not getting into a space of music, but it's more into a uh, getting to a state of trance right away. Okay. Okay. And do you think connects like open throat singing or open throat chanting can also relieve you of stress? Like, you know, if you're... Is that comparable to the bathroom singing many people do just because they can do their relief, uh, you know, relieve their stress? See, um, any activity done with in a state of mindfulness will definitely relieve stress. Okay. So whether it's running or exercising or just um, sheer yoga and uh, singing is any form of singing compares to that. Okay. So when, you, when you're singing, um, See, when you're exercising and singing, that's a different story altogether, okay? But when you're actually focusing on the music that you're singing and giving you 100% into it, it definitely takes you to a different space. Okay. Okay. That's good. And also, it's, uh, you know, great information that you shared with us, Kanix, about, you know, our ancestors, 2,000-year-old. You know, they still used music as a vehicle to yes. propaganda the, the, the importance of taking care of ourselves. The Correct. importance of having a good health, mm -hmm. the importance of having good mental health, you know. Yes. And mm -hmm. they've used uh, music and they've used their scriptures as vehicles to pro do the propaganda. Yeah. And, uh, and especially to talk on that in a platform like Red Sari, which promotes, you know, the well-being of good mental health and uh, well-being on the, in all uh, factors of health to the South Asians. It's very, very important. It made a lot of sense, you know, that yeah. uh, Thank you. it's been mm -hmm. spoken to us very early in times. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I know you, uh, there is a uh, poetry in uh, Tirupugal too, which uh, talks to you about the herbs that should be taken when you have a bad cold, you know, like a pneumonia, like typically, you know, all these herbs that can be Amma. taken. Yeah, that is actually mentioned in multiple places. Uh, if you remember the rehearsal that we had in 2018, when we uh, prepared ourselves for this uh, performance, Kanda in the temp in the uh, in Cincinnati, uh, we learned a trip word called Talai uh, Mayir Kokku Kokkanarai. So, see, Arunagiri Nadal lived what some 500 years ago, or um, 
something around that, probably even more. Um, okay. I don't have the exact date right now. So one of the things, uh, his poetry is rich in rhythm. Okay. Every line follows the same uh, meter. And uh, they are full of very interesting facts. And one of them talks about aging. So, and it also talks about using Tirivalai uh, Sukkutipilit. So what it means is that um, the use of uh, uh, Trifala, which is an herb that is used in Ayurveda. Sukkut is dry ginger and Tipili is another herb. So he talks about using these and uh, um, actually frying them in oil and then distilling them and drinking that juice as a cure for diseases. But what okay. he says is that even that cannot stop you from dying when your time comes. Okay. So, but what, what we learn from this is that these forms of medicine have been around and have been practiced in different parts of the country. And even the poets knew of them and they've kind of introduced them even to the devotional liter literature. So when you study these and understand the meaning, you really get what they're talking about. Thank you. I have a question. It's from uh, Sakti, Saktivel Sadepan. Yes. He asks, how long will it take before I notice a difference? I can't sit still for 10 minutes. Is it okay if I moved around? Do you recommend some songs for us? Um, <laughs> okay, I just shared a song on the internet uh, recently. It, these are based on Tirumular's ver verses. Um, uh, see, like I said before, Tirumula lived 1500 years ago and he talked about yoga. So he's the first person in India who, who has left behind literature, which actually talks about physical forces. Um, and we made a song out of it and sang it in um, the production last year in Chicago. And we made another, we had another performance and recorded it. And it's out on my Facebook page and you can look for it there. It's a slow moving song. And... Uh, if you just put it on a loop and listen to it, it'll, it'll, people have told me that it helps them still and helps them in the yoga practice and so on. But again, uh, Sati, I don't have a prescription answer for this. It, again, it all depends on the individual that is uh, trying to still themselves and there's no particular formula in any way, shape or form. But the bottom line is, bottom line is if you have the intention um, to do this and if you start focusing on your breath, and if you start focusing on um, reproducing just one pitch with the mm sound, with the buzz in your lips, it is only a matter of time before you slowly begin to resolve yourself into yourself. And things that, that, that can actually help generate that silence in you are the sound of bells. Um, so you listen to the bell and then you listen to the silence that follows after the bell. And then you indulge in the mm sound. It makes a huge difference to your system. Thank you, Kanix. Sure. Uh, the next question is from Suresh. He yeah. asks how to control our voice fluctuation and thinning when singing, perhaps with nervousness and anxiety. We sing for joy, but become stressed out due to anxiety about audience. How to manage it? Any tips? Yeah. Um, actually, in this day and age, there's plenty of tools and tips with which you can practice. like. Um, um, like the karaoke tracks that you have, the sing-along track, tracks that you have, you, if you project them on a big screen and stand in front of them and sing, half your nervousness is have, uh, you have a slide of audiences in an auditorium and have it projected on your screen and then just sing in front of them. So just for the sake of it, you know, that might actually help you um, overcome this to some extent. Um, and also, um, so, so my daughter used to play with, uh, when she was in preschool, she used to assemble a set of stuffed animals in a, animals in a circle. Then she used to pretend to be a teacher and talk to each one of them. <laughs> to me, that was a very valuable lesson. She was actually recreating a setting for real life in our uh, family room. Yes. Yeah, something like that um, kind of exaggerates what we're trying to do, but I think it's definitely worth, worth it. And it's, it's definitely fruitful. But more than that, Suresh, Try to sing for yourself. You don't have to sing for anyone at all. Um, that is probably the greatest joy that you can get. Put, put yourself in a room where there's a little bit of an echo. Um, just try to hear the sound of your own voice. And the longer that you hold a note, um, I mean, this lecture is not supposed to be a training class in music, but the longer you hold a note, 
the more stable it will become and the more steady it will become the more pleasure you will get out of it that's a very good point you said uh, connects to sing for ourselves not for yes. anybody you know yeah. that's that is the key thank you yeah. and there's a uh, the next question is from rama kasturi and yes. she rama is the president of uh, red sari and her question is can you explain how music therapy can be used in patients with trauma and ptsd um that's a tough question to answer because i don't have experience in that i can only say from what i've heard um the in general and again i'm going to keep it a generality is in general music promotes mindfulness and uh, it definitely has a calming effect depends on what you're listening to so when i was recovering from my uh, bypass surgery um i was in a state of afib and i was just unable to sleep you, you know the state of restlessness that i had was uh, just unbelievable it was nightmarish um uh I was in the hospital i could move but at, but at the same time there was uh, i was hearing my i was listening to the sound of my heart it was getting louder i could see the pace changing and all that it was it was dreadful so i just started listening to this work called akshara manamalai which is associated with the uh saint of tiruvannamalai his name is ramana maharishi right so this is a work of 50s um oh no a, a, a number of verses in tamil written by him and it sung in a kind of a monotonous tune and i just hit the play button and put it on loop and just heard it over and over and over again and within a while i was asleep and then every time i felt restless i just used to listen to it so for each person it's a different piece of music that actually, that uh, brings them into a state of rest to me it was that uh, piece of music at that point in time yeah. thank you so much for uh, sharing your experience uh, connex yeah of course over there yeah thank you yeah. The next question is from Annie Thomas. That she says thank you for sharing the mindfulness approach and her question is what integrative approaches do you recommend specifically for our elderly during covid era? Um I think a structured um I'm not an expert in this, in this but I can tell you tell you this much based on my own experience. Um another 30 years I'll be in the elderly state I think. um it's it's somehow or the other at some point in time it's going to catch up with us and at any given point in time during a given day we actually fluctuate from being a being a kid from being a spoiled kid to a responsible adult to a mature adult to somebody who's passed all this okay so we actually go through many different states of mind and the age is pretty much in our um uh, it's it's just a state of being having said that the things that help us at least the things that help me i can only share from my personal experience are if i bring structure to my life it definitely helps if i bring goals to my life it definitely helps the third thing i heard is that uh, if i'm in a, if if i am in distress this is something i've read and i've actually found it useful i've pro- shared this with my mother and she finds it useful also find something to do with your fingers engage your fingers so it's, it could be an activity such as knitting or uh, stitching or anything plus also um even writing a writing with a pen makes a huge difference and also guided listening of music will make a very big difference so guided meditation through music for a structured period of time every day and also another exercise that i do is just letting go of everything and just pretending that it's a holiday so do you all remember i'm sure everybody can relate to this time when we were in school middle school not even high school and uh, when the vac- when the summer holidays started there was a feeling of abandon there was a feeling of total joy basically there was nothing to do we were free yes and basically i think that is the nature of a free soul right you see a little baby cat a kid a kitten the kind of joy it radiates i mean we are all capable of radiating that kind of joy but how do we access that space so there are ways to create that one is by particular if you say it in tamil it's like one hour leave would rather so it's like just declare a break de- declare a vacation from everything saying that nothing is going to move in the next one hour okay you no matter what you do even if there's a huge problem to deal with you're not going to be able to do anything with it if you give a break for about an hour nothing is going to change give that one hour to you, yourself you 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 deserve it and so if 
if we are caring for the elderly, would it be possible for us to facilitate an atmosphere and steer conversations towards that one hour where everybody can let go of everything and just be in a relaxed state? When you come out, you're slightly different from what you were before you started that thing out. If you do it on a re repeated basis, you tend to see that these period, periods of abandon tend to stick on to you. Yes, yes. Uh, Dinesh says, music has the ability to freeze time. I have yeah. often found that playing old songs to my grandparents when they were alive brought back memories they had forgotten, which has a calming outcome. So oh. Dinesh has a little bit to us. Yeah, I agree totally. Yes, um, music has, has the ability to take us back to the time where we listened to it first. Um, most of us would agree that the songs that we, the music that we like best is the stuff that we listen to when we're in college. Mm -hmm. The freshman year is the time when you're in the period of greatest abandon. You know that you have a feeling that you're going to conquer the earth. Uh, yes. There's nothing stopping you. You're unstoppable. Um, and uh, when you listen to music from that period, something wakes up in you and you're taken back to that time so i'm yes. sure so um 30, 20 years from now when i listen to music from the 1970s i'm probably going to have the same feel like, so yeah. yes and rama has one more question for you Kanix. Mm -hmm. uh, can you share websites that offer the kind of music for mindfulness that you recommend um yeah let me put together a set of links and uh, uh, send them to you basically you what um, my mother listens to certain chants and it's uh, she listens to a website to a website called mahakatha.com or org I don't know what it is but it's constantly playing in a room and she says it actually gives a relief from pain she um, her, um, uh, this this particular chants in there which she says really give you relief from pain I'm happy to share those with you. I'll send them to you separately. Actually, so that'll be great, Kanix, if you can yeah. put a list of uh, links that has, yeah. you know, soulful, uh, uh, you know, calming, restful music, and then Absolutely. share it with Red Sari, and we would love to share it with all our subscribers. And I'm hoping that uh, in, the, in the next year or so, in 2021, I'm hoping to initiate some projects where I, where I actually record. So I have a whole wish list of uh, recordings to make. Uh, let's hope I get to make them at some point in time. May your wish be fulfilled because it will Thank benefit so all of us. I, I wish you and uh, I hope it, it's taken care of by next year. But thank you so yeah, much. You so it much. was such a such My a pleasure. informational session, Kanix. You know, it was like thank sitting you. in your living room and listening to you heart to heart, <laughs> you know, as always. And, uh, you know, you've given us enough information on, you know, the history and the process of music, how it has evolved and how it mm -hmm. has come to play a major role in our lives to, yeah. you know, but that has become so therapeutic, especially in times like this, you know, yeah. it has been therapeutic when we were sitting for our state exams and board exams, and it's also been therapeutic <laughs> now. Yeah. So, you know, thank you so much for enlightening us with all the information. Yeah. It's been so a pleasure. This is just the tip of the iceberg. And uh, thank you for letting me share it with you. And uh, thank you, everybody, for coming in and listening. And if you have any questions, feel free to email me or call me or text me or anything like that. I'm always happy to talk about these, these topics and share more. So uh, thanks again. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kanix. And uh, good night to all the viewers who are here today. And I hope you can all take a great take-home message about music and how to appreciate it by being more mindful and appreciating, you know, the different nuances and the different instruments and the genres. Thank you so much, everybody. And I thank Retsari, its thank President you. Rama Kasturi, Secretary Lata Samu, and its founder, Saktivel Sadeyapan, and Treasurer Uday Shekhar for giving me this opportunity to moderate Kanix. It's always a pleasure, and thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.